By March 1945, the once mighty Luftwaffe had been ground down to almost non-existence by the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Forces in the skies above Europe. But it was here, at Munich Ream, that General Leutnant Adolf Galland would form one special unit that would take the fight to the Allies one last time. So this whole area that I'm walking through now was once Munich Ream airfield. It's hard to believe now it's changed vastly uh, since its closure on the 16th of May 1992. But its history is really interesting. It was meant to open on the 1st of September 1939. However, something took precedence over that, and that was the invasion of Poland. Instead, however, it opened on the 25th of October 1939. So almost two months later and one of the first people to land here and one of the first people to use the airfield was actually Adolf Hitler himself and that was on the 11th of November 1939. So you've got to remember that Munich was ideally sighted and Munich Ream airfield especially because it meant that the senior leadership could fly down from Berlin, they could land here at Munich Ream and then take their staff cars or their train down to Berchtesgarten and the Ober Salzburg to the residences that were uh, that were in that area. Now it's a housing estate, you can see behind me there's loads of modern flats, there's businesses here, there's all sorts, but there are still some traces and this building here behind me is one of the original airfield buildings that date back to the late 1930s. But during World War II this was an operational Luftwaffe airfield and it was here that General Leutnant Adolf Galland would form Jagdverband 44 or Fighter Band 44 flying the ME262 into combat in the skies above Europe in the dying days of World War II. Now there are still some traces of the old airfield here and behind me it's a little difficult to see but these were the old spectator stands that formed the outer perimeter of the airfield. It was almost a bowl shape. And it was here where members of the public could come and watch the aircraft and watch air displays. Although clearly with the war starting to ramp up, these didn't last long, but there are still examples of them and they stretch right around part of the old airfield still. Although sadly, due to health and safety concerns, they're now fenced off. Now the real significance of Munich Ream would be felt in March 1945, because it was here that General Leutnant Adolf Galland, the former General der Jagdflieger, or the basically the general of the fighter arm of the Luftwaffe, after he was dismissed from that, he would come here with his unit, Jagdverband 44, and they would operate ME262s from this airfield, as well as a small detachment of Focke-Wulf 190 D9s and D11s who would act as their protection squad. So by the end of 1944, Adolf Galland's relationship with Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe and one of the original party members and a First World War fighter pilot himself, their relationship was becoming very, very strained. It was in 1941, in November, that Adolf Galland was appointed by Göring to assume the role of General der Jagdflieger, or head of the fighter arm for the Luftwaffe. And this was after the death of Gallen's friend, Werner Mulders. He was on his way to Ernst Udet's funeral when his aircraft crashed and sadly he was killed. Although Gallen didn't necessarily want to assume the role of General der Jagdflieger, he was very much a fighter race. By the end of 1941, I think his kills were up to 96. He assumed the role with great passion and great vigour. He was a very clever individual and he really knew the business of employing fighters in the air in an offensive and defensive manner. Now January 1942 he was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves, swords and diamonds which from a German perspective the award uh, doesn't really get any better than that. And then shortly after that he was responsible for Unternehmen uh, Donnerkiel or Operation Thunderbolt in support of the Kriegsmarines Operation Cerberus which was the channel dash of the German battleships up through the English Channel and to ports of safety uh, 
further towards Germany. So during Gallen's tenure as General der Jagdflieger, he would see his fighter arm ground down by the increase in operations by the Royal Air Force at night under the command of Bomber Harris with Bomber Command and then with the entry of America into the war in late 1941 but then their operations really ramping up from 1942 onwards with the advent of the B-17 and B-24 heavy bombers as well as the medium bombers from the 9th United States Army Air Force operating in the skies over Europe he would see his fighter force worn down essentially because the German high command, the very highest of high command, they did not perceive that defensive fighters were a priority. Instead, a lot of resources were put into the Wonder Weapons, the V1s, the V2s, and the ME262. But that was misprioritized. It was wanted as a bomber, as a strike bomber, uh, but Galland and the other Luftwaffe races could clearly see its potential as an advanced jet fighter that could intercept these bombers, these mass bomber streams during daylight raids by the United States Army Air Force, intercept them at high speed, run and gun, with their four Mark 108 30 mm cannons in the nose. They were a great gun platform, packed an incredibly heavy punch, and would be able to zoom into the bomber stream, knock down bombers, return, do it again, and then recover to their airfields. But that was never fully put into practice en masse for the ME262. And that was something that really riled Galland and the other Luftwaffe officers. Now, as a result of Galland seeing his fighter force be ground down um, through this attritional warfare between 1943 and into late 1944, he started to conflict quite heavily with Goering and started to come up, you know, started to meet a lot of resistance with those at the positions of high command, and he made his feelings known. So much so that in early January 1945, Galland was dismissed by Goering as General der Jagdflieger, and that led to an event that was known as the Fighter Pilots Revolt. So the Fighter Pilots Revolt took place on the 19th of January 1945 in Berlin, and this was where a number of senior Luftwaffe fighter aces, not Galland, he wasn't present, but others were. And it was during this meeting with Goering that the likes of Oberst Trautloff, Johannes Mackey Steinhoff, uh, Lutzau, to name but a few, all vehemently protested Goering's decision to remove Galland. Now, Galland wasn't there, but Goering believed that he had put these men up to it. He hadn't. He had accepted his fate, and in fairness to Galland, he half expected the Gestapo to end up uh, basically saying that, you know, much like Rommel had to uh, in 1944, that it would be expected that Galland would take his own life uh, in order to uh, save face. Um, he couldn't be executed out of hand because he was a fighter race and he was a hero of Germany. And, the uh, German command, the high command, and the party put a lot of emphasis on their war heroes. They really elevated them to, a, to such a high level that they were public figures and that to arrest them and then execute them, it, it didn't look good. So, you know, there were other ways of dealing with those who would rise up against them. So as a result of the fighter pilots revolt, Goering had seen red. He had lost it with his Luftwaffe fighter races. As such, those that protested Gallen's removal were then banished, some to Italy, some to the east. Uh, Steinhoff, for instance, wasn't even allowed on a Luftwaffe airfield. Uh, that's how angry the whole incident had made Goering. But ironically, the man to save Galland and to give him an opportunity to prove what he had always believed about the ME262 in that it should be used as a fighter and not as a strike bomber, was Hitler. He said, give him command of the squadron that he wants. Let him form his 262 unit. Now, I don't think this was as benevolent as it necessarily seems on the surface. It was probably done with the hope that eventually 
he would be killed in combat. He would go out on a hero's death, you know, the whole Valhalla type concept that the party believed in. But what this did give Galen the opportunity to do was pick the pilots he wanted and form the unit that he wanted to. And that is where Jagdverband 44 or Fighterband 44 came into being. Originally, the unit was formed at Brandenburg Airfield in the north near Berlin. But it was on the 31st of March 1944 that Jagdverband 44 relocated here to Munich Ream. So there's a few important things to consider with the formation of Jagdverband 44 and when it took place. So March 24th, 25th, Operation Varsity Plunder. Field Marshal Montgomery launched the most successful Allied airborne operation, jumping the River Rhine with the 6th Airborne, British 6th Airborne, and the United States 17th Airborne Division. Also followed up by those amphibious forces that crossed the River Rhine uh, and moved up to support the airborne forces. This all took place um, around Wesel in northern Germany, in Hamelkown, but the Allies were already in Germany, so that's one thing to consider. Secondly, the ME262, whilst revolutionary in terms of its engines and its sleek design, it was being made predominantly at this stage in the war by slave labour. Um, and I have actually documented one of the sites, Kuno in Bavaria, where the aircraft were finally assembled and then taxied out onto the autobahn and flown away to their forward units. So they were being made in very austere conditions. Now, clearly the manufacturer of the 262 was in complete contrast to the actual design itself and its uh, revolutionary engines. So as the Allies are pushing heavily into Germany at this point, they're almost unstoppable. Obviously pockets of German resistance exist, but for the most part, the Allied logistical chain is able to support the advance of the British in the North, along with the Canadians, and then the Americans and the French armies as they're rolling into the very heart of Germany itself. Don't forget as well, coming from the East, you've got the Soviet forces and they really were an unstoppable steamroller. The Germans at this point in the war, they really had so few resources to start building up new fighter forces, new aircraft squadrons. But Gallen somehow managed to scrape together enough aircraft, enough logistic support, and men who wanted to fly with him. And this is a really interesting part about Jagdverband 44. So while Munich Ream Airfield was the operating home of Jagdverband 44, the aircrew and the operations staff didn't uh, live here, they didn't work here per se. Obviously the pilots and the mechanics when they came to fly the aircraft were from here. But for the remainder of that time and for their operations staff, they were based in the village of Feldkirchen and they were billeted or their operations staff were working from what was known as the orphanage and it got that name because during the war years it was it did act as an orphanage and we will go and take a look at that and see what remains of that place in 2023. So this is the town of Feldkirchen and it was here where the officers of Jagdverband 44 would live in and amongst the local houses um, and then their officers mess and operations room was also located here. Now this was clearly done for tactical reasons. Whilst they could have done this um, out of the airfield at Munich Ream because of the Allied air superiority at the time, what they didn't want to do was, when under attack, lose all their operations staff and have their accommodation bombed at the same time. So they dispersed that and they came here to Feldkirchen, which is about a six minute car drive away from Munich Ream itself. 
you walk through Feldkirchen, um, and this is the old part, you know, we've got the War Memorial behind me, and then the building there behind me over my shoulder, that was the officer's mess and the operations room. Now, it is uh, still an orphanage to this day. It's still uh, used for the sort of the protection and care of children. So I'm not going to film there for what I hope is obvious reasons. You know, I'll, I'll acknowledge what they do there is, is vital work. Um, but there is a great photo, a great sort of then photo that was taken um, at the officer's mess in 1945 whilst uh, or taken, sorry, outside of the officer's mess in 1945 whilst Jagva Band 44 were billeted here in Feldkirchen and operating out of Munich Ream. Now in terms of the pilots that wanted to fly with Galland, he attracted numerous Luftwaffe aces, those who had fallen from political grace in the Luftwaffe because of their differing views with the party ideology and those who just wanted to fly the latest and greatest ME262 fighter. Now in JV44, there were 17 Knights Cross recipients, and these included the likes of Oberleutnant Heinz Barr with 221 victories, Major Gerhard Barkhorn with 301 victories, Oberst Johannes Mackie Steinhoff with 176 victories, Hauptmann Walter Krupinski with 197 victories, and Oberst Gunther Lutzau with 108 victories. Now the ME262, despite it being a brand new fighter, revolutionary because of its jet engines, it did have its weaknesses. And this was, ironically, centered around the engines, the UMO 004 engines. Now because of the temperatures and pressures involved with gas turbine engines, even the very early ones, they needed a lot of rare metals in order to be able to sustain the temperatures and pressures that they were under. One problem with these engines and Germany's lack of mineral resources and lack of uh, material resources was that when those engines were advanced using the throttles in the aircraft, if that was done too quickly, you could either snuff out the engines and they would just quit, not good, or worse, they would catch fire. So it was essential for the pilots that careful application of the throttle was used during all stages of flight from taxi takeoff to climbing out and then to operating the aircraft and then recovering the aircraft back to land. It was during takeoff and landing at these stages of flight that the ME262 was extremely vulnerable. If the pilot flying the 262 was bounced, i.e. he was attacked by an allied fighter, he wouldn't just be able to advance the throttles quickly, zoom out of trouble, come back around and try and engage the Allied aircraft. That just wasn't possible with these early engines on the 262. Now, because of this operating limitation of the ME262, it was decided that essentially a protection squad was needed for the aircraft whilst it was operating from here at Munich Ream. And that protection squad was formed using five Focke-Wulf 190 Ds, or Doras, as they were uh, collectively known by the Luftwaffe, under the command of Leutnant Heinz Sachsenberg. Operating five Focke-Wulf 190 D9s and D11 versions of the aircraft, its duties were to take off before the ME262s, clear out the airspace around the airfield, and then once the ME262s were airborne and had formated and left the local airspace, they would land. Ironically, given the ME262's vulnerabilities when it was coming into land, the Platzschutzfarm didn't have any obligation to scramble to protect the aircraft whilst they were coming back to land. So on the 9th of April 1945, the 8th United States Army Air Force would launch mission 935. Its objectives for that day were to hit a number of airfields, one of them being Munich Ream right here. The raid itself here at Munich Ream was assigned to two combat bombardment wings, the 13th and the 45th. The 13th combat bomb wing comprised of the 100th bomb group flying out of Thorpe Abbotts, the 95th bomb group from Horham, and the 390th flying out of Framlingham. The 45th combat bomb wing comprised of the 388th bombardment group flying out of Nettershall, the 452nd flying out of Depham Green, 
and the 96 Bomb Group flying out of Snetterton Heath. So between the two combat bombardment wings that struck Munich Ream here on the 9th of April 1945, they put up 212 B-17G flying fortresses. A total of 550 tons of bombs were dropped here on the airfield. So I'm really lucky that in my military collection I have this album from the 7th Photographic Group. Now these guys, in my mind, were the unsung heroes of the Mighty Eighth. They would fly modified Lightnings and Mustangs on reconnaissance missions over Europe. They'd be on their own, armed only with a camera, to conduct battle damage assessment of targets that had been struck on previous days by the heavies and the medium bombers of the United States Army Air Forces operating out of England. And this is a great album. This contains loads of photos from different places across Europe, from Paris, in France, through to different locations in Germany, as well as some great private photos that were taken in England of various villages and the local airbase during World War II. But one photo in here is specific to here at Munich Ream. So just to give you an idea of the quality of some of the photos here that were taken by the uh, cameras of the 7th Photographic Reconnaissance Group, here we've got um, F5 Lightnings, and they were F5s, not P38s, because P was the designation for pursuit aircraft. So F was given to photo reconnaissance aircraft because the F for fighter, as in F16, F14, F15, etc., didn't come about until the United States Air Force became its own independent service away from the Army in 1947. Um, so we've got these photos of various aircraft. And these are all original, taken by the group at the time. And then we see B-17s parked up, B-26s. And then, as we flick through, we have different target sets and the reconnaissance work, the post-battle damage assessment carried out low-level over Germany in April 1945. And we can see the true power of the Allied bombing offensive here in these images. Here's another great set though. Here we've got the Trocadero in Paris, in France, and some more images as well. And there we've got the Arc de Triomphe there and the Champs Elysees there in Paris. An incredible resolution, incredible camera quality, considering these images are 78, 79 years old. Here's the photo in question. This is Munich Ream airfield. It's also stated here um, along the top. And we know that it was taken on the 10th of April, 1945. Also taken, I believe this is the altitude, 24,000 feet. And as you can see from the image, it was a lovely clear day when this photo was taken. So I'm currently sat sort of roughly in this area here and this was the seating area that we could see in the footage earlier along with the original building that still remains all of this whole area now is the housing estate that you can see on the drone footage but interestingly with these uh with this image sorry is you've got these blast pens here and in them we can still see some aircraft dotted in and amongst the blast pens some out in the open and we can also see them here on this extended hard standing out here that lies uh, to the south of the airfield. And that's that way behind me there. So this is uh, a really interesting photo. And you can see the, the precision that the Americans were able to employ during their daylight bombing offensive toward the end of World War II. This was the main runway here for the ME-262s. And look at how badly cratered it is. That's what, you know, approximately 550 tonnes of high explosive ordnance will do to a target with very little AAA and fighter opposition. So as the war started to draw to a close and the American forces closed in on this position, it was eventually liberated by the 42nd Infantry Division. But prior to the Americans arriving here, because uh, Galland and the men knew that the American forces were advancing on this area, their plan 
to relocate to different airfields in Austria fell through and in the end as a unit they relocated to Maxglan airfield near Salzburg. The Focke-Wulf 190s of the Platz Schutzens farm they moved to a separate airfield in Austria and this was just to try and give them some breathing space. Now by this time Johannes Mackey Steinhoff he had been very very badly burnt in a crash on takeoff when his ME262 couldn't get off the deck and it slammed into the ground, caught fire, and he was horrifically burnt. Galland had been shot through the knee and he was then starting his recuperation process at the Florida rest home on Tegensee. And you can see that house actually in one of my earlier videos on the channel. At this point, Jagverband 44 was starting to fall apart. The end of the war was basically in sight and everybody knew it. So in the time that Jagverband 44 existed, they were able to take the fight to the enemy and they were quite successful. And that's not surprising given the amount of Knights Cross holders and aces that were in the group. They had a kill ratio of about four to one and did have numerous successes with relatively few losses considering how active and how aggressive the American fighter pilots were at this stage in the war and how numerous they were as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this short episode all about Jagdverband 44 and the former airfield here at Munich Green. Uh, I hope it's given you a slight insight into some of the operations that were being conducted by the Luftwaffe during this late stage in World War II and given you an appreciation for those pilots who flew as part of Jagdverband 44. Okay, I'll see you all in the next one.